Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I'm like Brett. I am so excited to be here. I couldn't hardly sleep last night. And uh, I agree with Brett. This is the way that it was meant to be. When God designed the church, when he put his son Jesus Christ as the head of the church, obviously he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew that we needed this, that we needed to see each other, that we needed to have fellowship, that we needed to take time out that we may not normally take on our own. He knew that we would need it, so he made a command that we should assemble together. And listen, I am so thankful for the technology that we have and, and being able to reach people, but it's not the same. We've been doing our men's Bible study through Zoom, and uh, we finally met back here and spread out last Wednesday, but uh, I'm telling you, it's much better. On Zoom, sometimes we are looking at people's ceiling fans, people get up and walk off, and I don't know what they're doing, if they're getting coffee or what they're doing. You hear papers rustle and things like that. It's so much better to go this route. And uh, I, I was telling Jill and Chris, I've, I've known them for years, and when Jill walked in, I said, you know, all the years I've known you, I don't think I've ever hugged you, uh, but I haven't seen you in such a long time, I just want to hug you, and I feel that same way about everybody, I just want to hug everybody, but we're not quite there yet, we'll, we'll save that for later. I was fist bumping everybody, and then I went up to Glendon, and she started, I almost got her, she started to fist bump, she goes, get out of here. We've done more than fist bumping, so, you know, honey bear and licky face, and if my boys were here, they would say, that's gross, dad, <laughs> but uh, I am so glad that you're here this morning. And, and I'm glad that you're healthy and safe. Listen, we've been praying from the, the very first week that this started. We got a group of people together, and we were praying, God, in the midst of this, will you do the impossible? Will you grow us spiritually, numerically, and financially? And I'm telling you, through this, God is, is doing it. And all three of those areas, I got to witness to a guy Friday and share the, the gospel with him. I may mention that in the message. I may not, depending on how much I babble on right now. But uh, anyway, uh, just really excited for what God's doing. Another prayer that we prayed, and when we first started praying this, I was thinking, is this a selfish prayer? Uh, we said, Lord, don't let one person and our congregation get this. We have some very vulnerable people in our congregation. We have nurses that are working on the front lines. We have a doctor, Dr. James Lorenzi, uh, who is a traveling doctor to all the nursing homes uh, in this area. But we said, Lord, don't, please don't let one person get it in our congregation. And I thought, I, you know, I don't want anybody to get it, but is that a selfish prayer? And I got to thinking, no, it's not. I, I pray the same thing for my own family. And this is family. We're family here, and that's the way God meant it to be. And, and, and we are praising God that so far, nobody in our congregation has gotten it. And, and as far as layoffs and things like that, uh, we've had some people that have voluntarily uh, laid off. Uh, and then we've had some that are laid off, but because of the stimulus and because of the unemployment, they're doing okay, and they are going to go back to work. So we do praise the Lord for that. But listen, this is real. And we shouldn't, you know, just thumb our nose at this because there are people that are still dying from this, and we need to pray for their family. In fact, uh, Candy uh, just told me this morning that she has a praise, and I'd like for Candy to share that praise. This is Candy right back here. So, good morning. Is it on? Aaron will help you put the. Um, COVID is really real. Um, it hit a couple of friends of Rick and mine, been friends for over 30 years. March 24th, my friend's husband became sick. He was home a week sick. They both work in the hospital that I work at in Joplin. I work from home up here. Um, March 29th, he was, his name is Chester. He was admitted to the hospital um, and diagnosed with COVID. He was in intensive care. He did not go on a ventilator, praise God for that. There's been a lot of prayers going up for him. Um, but he was very, very sick. Carlene couldn't go see him. They've been married over 40-some years. It really is real how hard it is to let your loved one be in a hospital and not be able to be there with them. He was released in a week. He's had a rough road. Um, he had been readmitted two different times to the hospital after that first admission. Not only did it affect him respiratory-wise at the beginning, but when he went home, it affected his kidneys. He had to go back in and he had to have IV fluids because his kidney function was bad. 
then um, it affected his GI system. So when these people go home, we still need to keep them in their prayers because we don't know who's went Amen. through this, but we personally know this couple and how hard it was been, was on both of them. At one time, Carlene is his wife. She looked at him and said, Chester, are you trying to die on me? He mm -hmm. said, I can't tell you I haven't thought about it. I don't want to, but that's how bad it is. It's very yes. real. And until you know somebody personally, we've had him on our small group prayer chain, um, different prayer chains praying for them. God answers prayers, and he Amen. definitely has answered prayers with Carlene and Chester, and we're so thankful for that. Amen. Praise God. Let's uh, just go to the Lord in prayer right now and ask him to bless this message today and also uh, pray for this family. Father, we thank you so much once again for who you are, Lord. We know at the end of the day, Lord, that you are in control. Lord, we also know that you said that um, there would be disease, uh, there would be trials and tribulations in this life. But Lord, you said that you will walk with us through any trial and tribulation. And we cling to that, Lord, and we thank you for that, that we have a Savior that cares about us. And Lord, I thank you for this praise and for Chester. And uh, I just pray that you would continue to heal him, Lord. God, we lift up the families. Uh, we know that even here in Cass County, uh, we have had... Uh, a number of people that, that have had it, even though it may be less than, than other counties, Lord, but uh, we lift up every family um, that's had to go through this, and especially those who have lost loved ones, Lord, and we ask that you would comfort them. God, I ask that your power would be upon uh, your word today, and we'll give you all the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We are still uh, in the book of Ephesians. We took a little break out of the book of Ephesians uh, for Mother's Day. And uh, so today we're back in the book of Ephesians. We're still in chapter one. We haven't made it out of chapter one uh, in about four weeks. And uh, I, I hope you remember that when we started this book, I challenged everyone to read this book uh, at least once a week. It's a short book. You can read it once a week, and I promise if you read it once a week, it'll change uh, your life. And so if you haven't started doing that, we're only in chapter one. There's still time to do that. And uh, about two weeks before Father's Day, we're going to take a little bit of a break from Ephesians, and uh, we're going to bring uh, some series of messages uh, regarding fathers, and I'm excited about that. We are going to finish chapter 1 today, and so we're going to be reading uh, or going over verses 18 through 23, and as Paul writes this, we can, we can see this great concern that he has for the church at Ephesus, and, and not just the church at Ephesus, but all the surrounding areas. And, and Paul is very concerned, as we've already read, he's very concerned that believers in the church not only understand the Word of God, but they also put the Word of God into action. It's what James said, don't just be hearers, hearers of the Word, but be doers also. As we closed out the last time, it's been a couple of weeks, we closed out with the first part of verse 18, we learned that even understanding the Word of God and putting it into practice is great, but something greater than understanding the Word of God and putting it in practice is to have God's enlightenment and power while we are doing it. You know, we can get into the motion and, and serving mode and do all the right things that we're supposed to be doing and obeying God's Word, but if we don't have God's power behind it, we still have nothing. If we don't have God's power behind it, then we're just really going through the motions. How do we receive that power? Paul is saying we receive that power through prayer and through the Holy Spirit. Paul says when the combination of these three occur, the Word of God... And putting it into practice is great, but it's greater to have this uh, enlightenment that he talks about in, in verse 18. And he says, when these three occur, understanding the Word of God, putting God's Word into practice, and having the power and prayer behind it and the power of the Holy Spirit, then that's something really great. And, and he's also saying, when we have those three things in our life, if, if you... If your life seems boring and mundane right now, put those three things in your, in your life, and he's saying you'll have what Jesus said was the abundant 
life. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come to, to steal and to kill and destroy, or he said the, the thief yeah, does not come to kill, steal, and destroy. He says, I have come that they may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. So Paul's not content just to instruct in the Word of God, although we know that Paul was a great teacher. We saw last time he also prays that the hearts will be enlightened. He's praying so that the truth that they've heard and understand will come alive and capture their hearts so that the Holy Spirit oozes out of their souls and there can be no denying that they are true Christians. Just like the two disciples that we talked about whom Jesus met on the road to Emmaus who said, did not our hearts burn within us why he talked to us on the road and he opened up the scripture talking about Jesus. When we accept Christ as our personal Savior and the Holy Spirit dwells in us, our hearts should burn within us that we have the Lord, part of the Trinity, that lives in us. Listen, it's my desire, great desire, as a believer and as a pastor that every day that I wake up, that my heart would burn with the passion of Christ. So far in 22 years of, of ministry, you've heard me share this before, there's all kinds of ups and downs in ministry and all kinds of challenges, but there has not been a day that I don't wake up when my feet hit the ground in the morning that I say, Lord, what do you have for me today? I can't wait to see who you put me in front of today. I prayed that uh, as I was coming in Friday morning. Friday morning, someone came into uh, our church, a, a guy that was lost, 28 years old. And uh, I'm not going to tell you his name. He told me his name. And he just came in for directions. And I asked him his name, and I said, hey, you got time to talk a little bit? And we started talking. He was from China and uh, told me he was agnostic. And his dad fled China under persecution, and his dad became a Christian. And his mom became a Christian. He said all of his friends are, are Christians, but he was agnostic. We talked about that. I shared the gospel with him. He said that he wasn't quite ready. He says, I just don't really see the, the need for it like everybody else does. And he says, you know, it, it just seems like God's so far away from me. And I looked at him and said, well, what do you think this is about right here? And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, uh, the very fact that you're sitting across the table talking to me. I said, did you really wake up this morning and go, you know what, I'll bet you today I'm going to get lost. And I was in Lee Summit, and I'm supposed to get back to Kansas, and somehow I came out <laughs> this way and got all turned around, and I'm coming into a church to talk to a pastor. I said, do you think that's just happenstance? And so the, the point of all that is, is that when we live in the power of the Holy Spirit and we wake up every morning, we say, God, use me. God, enlighten my heart. God, open my eyes to the spiritual things that you would have for me. I'm telling you, that's where the Christian life gets exciting, and that is exactly what Paul is talking about. It's, it's my desire as your pastor that your heart would also burn with the passion of Christ and so that we're so motivated to carry out God's work of evangelizing, of taking care of the sick and the, and the poor and the widows. And, and I don't want to be just motivated to have a nice thought about it. I want to have the power of the Holy Spirit on my life, and I, and I desire the same for you, and the power of the Holy Spirit on our church so that we are truly a part of what God is doing, and we can feel His power. Listen, it, it's important not just to hold on to the intellectual truth. We have the intellectual truth, and, and it's important not just to hold on to mere academic understanding of the Word of God. That's very important. That's why we have discipleship, so that we can learn God's Word. But we must have the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to apply the truth. Now listen, I, I don't know why Baptists, good Baptists that we are, I don't know why Baptists are so afraid of the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if they think that uh, if we start talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, that they think we're going to start doing backflips or somebody's going to get 
uh, slain the spirit. We're going to smack people on the forehead and they're going to lay out or, or whatever. Maybe that's one reason we're afraid of it. Maybe it's because we don't fully understand how the Holy Spirit works in our life. Or maybe it's we just stop at the intellectual knowledge of knowing that the Holy Spirit takes up permanent residence in us the moment that we accept Christ. And that's true. And we just kind of stop there. We see it in Scripture. Okay, that's cool. We have the Holy Spirit. But think about this, and we, and we teach this in our discipleship classes and a whole lesson about the Holy Spirit. What is the function of the Holy Spirit in our life? The Holy Spirit has like 10 or 12 functions in our life that, that comes alive. I hope if, if you're not in discipleship, you'll sign up for that. John 14, 16, 17 says this. says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, meaning the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. The world does not have the power of the Holy Spirit because the world has not accepted Christ uh, as their personal Savior. It says, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Every single day that you wake up, right now as you're sitting there, the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity, lives within you. And that should make a difference in our life. The apostle understands the audience that he's writing to very well. That They were, like us uh, at times, good-meaning Christians who sometimes live in their own power instead of the power of the Holy Spirit. Our natural tendency is to serve the Lord, and serving the Lord is to take the least path of resistance, pandering at the lukewarm waters of mediocrity. Even though we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us, and the Holy Spirit wants to be unleashed and show us some great and mighty things. Jesus took notice of this with the church of Laodicea. And the, remember, we were in the book of Revelation. We talked about this in Revelation chapter 3.15 when he said, I wish that you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. He understood that the Ephesians Christians and, and the Christians at Ephesus, Ephesus they had kind of lost their zeal for the Lord. They were listless. They were down. They were dispirited. And Paul knew that if the Holy Spirit controlled the life of the believers, that they would come alive again. If they truly understood the power that they have in the Holy Spirit, they would come alive again, that they would be winners, that they would attempt great things for, for, for God and expect great things from God. I've been enthralled with the... Uh, Last Dance series. In fact, I've watched every series twice now. I can't wait till tonight. Series 9 and 10 is finally coming up. I am absolutely blown away by Michael Jordan's winning attitude. I mean, there was nothing that was going to stop him. Uh, any challenge, any obstacle that was in his way, he would overcome either through his own psychology in his head or, or use other people as a motivation to take him to that next height, and guess what? He did all that on his own. As far as I know, he doesn't know the Lord. I don't know that for sure, but that certainly didn't come out in the documentary. He did all that on his own, and what did he do it for? A ring. I mean, listen, we, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the power to be a winner for more than a ring, for more than money, for more than just growing a business. We have a platform that God has given us to make a difference in eternity forever. And, and I, wish, I wish all of us, including me, would have that every single day, that winning power that Michael Jordan had because we actually can do something with it and change the world. Listen, there's times when we all go through the motions and we grow apathetic. And, and, and Paul knows this, so Paul turns to prayer and his prayers reflect his understandings of the, of, of the needs of his day and, and the needs of today. 
And, uh, you know, I, I understand Paul doing this. Um, you know, when I get down, when I get listless or apathetic, I have to go to the Lord in prayer. I know that's the one thing. It's not going to be a pep talk from somebody that's going to get me back up. Uh, it's not going to be me going to a motivational class. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's probably not gonna even going to be me going to counseling. There's nothing wrong with that either. But I know this, every time I get my prayer journal out and I just spend some time with the Lord, and after I'm writing down prayers and writing down Scripture and sharing my heart with the Lord, I close that prayer journal up and I feel like I am on cloud nine because I've spent time with the Lord. And so Paul is praying, look at it with me, Ephesians 1, 18, and part of 19, he says, the eyes of your understanding, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, what is the inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power. We do not go through this life alone. We have this powerful God that walks with us, the exceeding greatness of his power towards us. We have access to this power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Paul lists three things that will help us to live in his power. He says, number one, know the hope that is in Jesus. Jesus conquered death because Jesus conquered death. There is nothing that we can't take on and nothing that we can't conquer. He also says, know the riches of his glorious inheritance and know the greatness of of his power. Paul prays that their heart would be enlightened or so filled with the Spirit that they truly experience the hope, the riches, and the power that Jesus has called us to. Listen, this call is not a call to a mundane, boring Christian life. When we have the Holy Spirit living in us and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not a boring life. You may say, well, pastor, what do you mean by being filled with with the Spirit. You said earlier, the moment that we get saved, that the Holy Spirit indwells us. And if that's the case, then how can we get more filled with the Spirit? Listen, it's not a matter of getting more uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, we discussed this in discipleship. The filling of the Holy Spirit is not you getting more of the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit getting more of us. It's us surrendering to that power and say, God, I don't want to do this on my own anymore. God, I want to live in your Holy Spirit power. And so it's us surrendering. We know that because the Bible says that we can quench the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is ready and active in our lives and ready to unleash that power, but many times we quench the Holy Spirit. How do we quench the Holy Spirit? We quench the Holy Spirit every morning we wake up and we just start the routine all over again and we don't even acknowledge God and acknowledge that we are a servant of His, we can quench the Holy Spirit. Every time we sin, we quench the Holy Spirit. Every time we tell that dirty joke that we think so funny or laugh at the dirty jokes, that other people tell that we think so funny, we quench the Holy Spirit. Every time we curse, we quench the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, is not you getting more of the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit getting more of of you. Listen to Romans 15, 13. It says this, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This passage that we're reading this morning is timeless. I believe if Paul were living today, he would have, would have written this very thing about our current COVID-19 situation. What we really need now in this time is hope. If you know a person, as we just heard the testimony this morning, if you know a person with COVID or you're terrified that you might get it, you need hope that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, according to Romans 
chapter 8. You need the hope that Jesus provides, promising us that there is a better future awaiting us no matter what happens. You need the hope that if you lost your job, it's just a temporary thing because Jesus has great riches and resources that you don't even know about. And according to Philippians, he says, I will supply all your needs according to my great riches. Listen, if you think you can't make it on your own, you're right. You can't. Men and women can accomplish a lot on their own. We do it every day. Michael Jordan accomplished a lot on his own. I used to have a rock on my desk at work. I'll, I'll probably get it back out when we get our new offices. I haven't had an office in a while, so I'll probably get it back out. But it's a Henry Ford saying, and it says this, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Listen, Paul's words are not just words on a rock or the power a positive thinking. No, he wants us to know whether you think God can or can't makes no difference. It's a fact. God will deliver us. He said that he would. God said that he would walk beside us. God said that we have the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Paul's words are not just the power of positive thinking. He's stating that the greatness of God is a fact, whether you believe it or not. The greatness is immeasurable. That's what he says here. It's immeasurable. Living in his power, we can accomplish great things that we never thought we'd be able to accomplish. We watched this firsthand in our church. I was thinking about as we all went over to the building yesterday and we're writing down verses and people are praying over the building. I, I, I just had to thank God again because when we first merged together, it was laughable to the banks that we would even talk to them about trying to get a loan and trying to build. But God did something amazing in his people, and the church started to grow, and people started to get excited about the Lord, and, and we realized that we couldn't do this on our own, and we needed God's power to do this. And then you fast forward a year later after they were laughing at us, and then banks were knocking on our door to see if they could give us a loan. Only God can do that. It's God's power, not us. Michael Jordan, again, he was able to accomplish a lot in human terms on his own, but you know what he was not able to accomplish? And you can see it in some of the interviews. He wasn't able to accomplish the nourishment of his soul. And the nourishment of the soul and true living and the abundant life only comes from the power of God working in and through us. Verses 19 and 20, it says this, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places? It's this resurrection power. That means that it's different. It's not like any other power. It isn't the power of a strong personality nor of an educated mind. It isn't the power of a good family background nor of money nor of numbers nor of leadership ability. It's the power that raised Christ from the dead. It's able to bring life out of death. What does it, this mean in practical terms? Well, it means it works best in a cemetery. If you're living in a cemetery, if everything is dead and dull and lifeless around you, try resurrection power, and you'll have life again. This is what it's for. It means that his power takes no notice of any obstacles in its way. Just as Jesus rose from the dead, paying no attention to the stone, paying no attention to the decrees of Caesar, to the wishes of the Jewish priest, to the guard in front of the tomb, resurrection power doesn't pay attention to obstacles. It just surges ahead, and it leaves the problems up to God, and we go on as we turn over 
our issues and our problems to God. It's understanding 1 Corinthians 16, 17. It says, therefore, do not lose heart. For even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction. Listen to this, for our light affliction, which is for a moment, is working for us far greater exceeding an eternal weight of glory. That's what's happening right now. COVID-19 is a momentary affliction. Just in case you think that Paul's not living this out and Paul's writing about something that he hasn't lived out, he's, he's lived this out. Listen, this just wasn't theory or head knowledge to him. Because a little bit farther down in Corinthians, we read that he describes his own experience. Listen, he had been beaten with rods three times. He had received 39 lashes five times. He had been shipwrecked three times. And night and day, he had been adrift at sea. And he had even been stoned once and left for dead. He was in danger constantly on the sea and on the land and in danger from false brethren spreading gospel, uh, or spreading rumors about him. He says he spent many a sleepless night and day without food or drink. Paul knew what he was talking about, and through all of that, he lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, and through all those circumstances, he was able to write, and God inspired him to write, the words that we are reading today. And all this catches up in one phrase, that slight momentary affliction. And he says that this is working for us. It's preparing us. That light momentary affliction is preparing us. It's preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Listen, right now, no matter what your circumstances, you have the hope that Jesus is with you. And Jesus will see you through your crisis. You have the riches of his inheritance, knowing that no matter what happens... At the end of the day, God's going to work it out. No matter what happens, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, you're going to be with Him in heaven forever. You have the inheritance of the Holy Spirit also who dwells in you and have the inheritance of the hope of His return. No matter how bad things get, He is returning to set things right, and He leaves us with the hope of the inheritance that He's gone to prepare a place for us. The Bible says, so that where he is, we may be there also. And not only do we have this power of the resurrection and the power of life that we're going to live with him forever and ever, we have this power right now in any situation that we're facing. There's no circumstance that we can go through that if not turned over to God, it won't work out to our advantage. God said that this doesn't mean that there won't be times in this life where we fail. If, when you live in God's power, you, though you realize there's really no such thing as failure. When you live in God's power, because God is teaching and working things through that, what we may consider failure or what other people consider failure, if we are a believer and the Holy Spirit is living in us, God is using that to mold us and to shape us and to conform us to His image. Failure is only the ability to start over with more experience. And that's the way we have to look look at it with the Holy Spirit in our life. Failure is only the ability to start over with more experience. It's the ability to be able to learn and say, Lord, I I didn't need to give into the flesh and handle things on my own, or I didn't need to give into despair and anger or impatience. I'll be more experienced the next time and I'll turn my problem over to you immediately and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the resurrection to take care of the situation. The apostle knows Christians everywhere are oftentimes immobilized by the grip of fear. He knows their insecurity. He knows uh, they are afraid of their neighbors sometimes. What will people think of me? Afraid of failure, afraid of persecution, afraid of ridicule. They don't think that they can do anything sometimes. They know and we know the the tremendous, relentless pressures that the world can bring on those who choose to live in the power of Jesus. 
The power of Jesus is the answer to fear. Think about anything right now that you are fearing. Maybe it's having a talk with somebody that you need to have a talk with. Maybe as an employee, it's, it's talking to your employer. Maybe as an employer, it's talking to your employee. Maybe it's talking to a loved one. Maybe it's something that God's put on your heart to do, and you're kind of afraid to do it. The power of Jesus is the answer to fear. The minute you feel a sense of ample power, you lose fear because power overcomes fear. Love overcomes fear. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. I am, I'll just be honest with you, I, I'm sometimes overwhelmed by the fact that so many Christians seem to give up. They feel like their struggles are just too much, that they just can't make it. And I think the reason that is, is because we've lost sight of the one who is giving us power. In verse 21, he tells us Jesus' power is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that age which is to come. It's far above, greater than any force, stronger than anything that can be launched against us. Paul stresses the fact that the name of Jesus is greater, the, greater than any name that is ever named. A policeman acts in the name of the law. The President of the United States acts in the name of the people. A salesperson acts in the name of the company. And some, quite honestly, act in the name of Satan. But Paul's talking about a name here, a name that is above every name. Acts 4.12 said, There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Of any name that can be named, the name of Jesus is greater. If you don't think so, just go out in public and mention the name of Jesus. And you're going to either get an amen, or you're going to have somebody that wants to curse you for even naming that name of Jesus. It's greater not only in time, but in eternity as well. Not only in this age, he says, but in the age to come. Never will there be a greater name than the name of Jesus. My goodness, what encouragement that gives us because he says that's the greatest name on the face of the earth. This is the greatest name that as believers, he has a relationship with us and he knows the plans he has for us not to harm us, but to prosper us. The last thing Paul tells us, that this power is made visible in the church. This is what this is all about. This is why... We are meeting here because God designed the church that that's a vehicle where we can see his power move. He says this in verse 22 and 23, and we'll close out very shortly with this, and he has put all things under his feet, and he made him head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness, the manifestation, the visible expression of him, Listen, this is why it's so important to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are the visible manifestation of Jesus Christ. You've heard it said before, you may be the only Jesus that people see. Think about this. Think about when before you accepted Christ, you were lost. You didn't really understand who Jesus was. In fact, the Bible describes it that you can't even understand spiritual thing because your eyes are blinded. So how is somebody going to see Jesus except they see him through us, except somebody tell them, except somebody share the gospel with them, and not only share the gospel with them, but live out an authentic life under the power of the Holy Spirit so that they can look at that and go, that's what that looks like. I'm interested. I think I may be in. The only place this kind of power is ever going to be manifest is in you and me, the people of the church, in the midst of our pressure and our problems. Power to be patient. Power to love when someone is irritating the socks off of you. 
but you love them nevertheless because the power of the Holy Spirit is in you. Power to be joyful in the midst of distressing circumstances. Power to be thankful for everything that comes our way. This is what Paul's talking about. The power to live as God intended men and women to live. He has come and is here with us and living in us to give us hope, to give us riches. And when I say riches, it could be money. It's not always money. Riches can also be that peace and contentment and the joy that you have. But he's come to give us hope, riches, and power, power to be what he wants us to be, power to be what we want to be also. Are you living in the power of the Holy Spirit today? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning for just a few minutes? And as I look at this crowd here, and since we're doing COVID-19 in several uh, services, each service is a little less, and I can look at everybody here, and I know everybody here, and I know everyone here has testimony that they've received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But I do want to talk just a few seconds to those that may be watching online, and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. Once you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you will have power and the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will indwell you and you will have God's power in your life. It's very simple. All you have to do is realize that you're a sinner and admit that you're a sinner and believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and ask Him to come into your heart. It would go something like this, Lord, as you're sitting there on your couch or wherever you're watching, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've done things against your word and I need you. I can't do it on my own. I want your power living in me. Lord, I need you as my Savior. Lord, would you come into my life and would you save me? Amen. If you've never done that, I want to encourage you to pray that prayer. Uh, if you're not quite ready and you want to know more about this, I encourage you to write us at rick at manakc.com. We would love to talk to you more about that. For us here in this audience and for those that are watching that are believers, just as you're with the Lord right now, ask yourself this question and ask the Lord the question, Lord, am I living in your power? Am I trying to do everything on my own or am I living in your power? The Bible says, greater is he, greater is he that's in you that is in the world. Father, we thank you so much for your great power. God, I thank you for who you are. God, I just pray that as we move forward, Lord, we're, we're just getting started, and I know that. I, I don't want anybody to think that as we get in that new building, wow, we've arrived, we've, we've reached the promised land. Lord, we know we still have a long journey and a lot of challenges ahead of us because we are attempting great things for you because... You are an all-powerful God, and because of that, we can expect great things from you. And Lord, I know the best is yet to come because of your power and your glory, and I ask that you would teach us all along the way. And I pray at the end of the day, Lord, that this church would stand out as a beacon of hope for you for generations to come, and we'll give you all the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen.